so th this is the concept that's most important uh, and always keep in your mind that your body isn't healthy if, it com if it's comfortable. Our mind wants to be comfortable. We want to sit and watch TV and eat popcorn. That's that's very enjoyable. But if you always do that, uh, your your mind and particularly your body will will atrophy. So you do need to push it. You'd need to be uncomfortable at least part of the time and then you recover. So running for 10 minutes, uh, losing your breath is great. Being hungry once in a while is great. Being hot in a sauna has benefits. Even being cold, we think, can help. We call these these concepts, well, overall, they, they're called hormesis, H-O-R-M-E-S, um, M-E-S-I-S. And the idea is that our bodies need a little bit of perceived adversity. Think of it this way, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And what's happening, we've discovered, comes back to these longevity genes that I mentioned earlier. We work on a set of seven genes called sirtuins. There are, there are others, but these ones control the scratches and they control your body's energy and fat content, your brain, Alzheimer's even, how, how fast that progresses. And here's the, the key thing. When you exercise, when you're hungry, these genes come on. They protect the body. They give you longer life, we think, and certainly health, increased health. But when you're sitting down, you don't do any of that stuff. They just say, hey, times are good. We don't need to work hard. Your body will not protect itself unless it actually thinks there's a threat to survival. So that's hormesis and it's super important. Well, hormesis is the concept of keep your body in a stress state okay. every day, once in a while. But actually getting to your point, Rob, about being hungry in particular, mm -hmm. um, I've always tried to keep a, a lean weight. I just have known that that's healthier. So I've tried to do that. Uh, but I thought that eating small meals during the day was the way to go because that's what nutritionists have said for at least most of the 20th century. Right. I don't believe that anymore. I think that the idea that you should always be satisfied and have snacks in between meals is wrong. I mean, certainly not not wrong for teenagers. We don't want malnutrition or starvation, heaven forbid. But what we're talking about is people 30, 40, 50 and beyond where metabolism starting to slow down. You're already gaining weight if you eat three meals a day. You don't want to do that. So I skip breakfast. I often skip lunch. I have a normal dinner, uh, healthy greens, and maybe a bit of meat. Um, mm -hmm. Though I've recently switched uh, to just fish as meat to see how that goes. Mm -hmm. But what's important is when you've got that hunger state, um, and you, know, you call it hunger, but I'm, I'm really never hungry. I'm used to this. After two weeks, you don't feel hungry. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm drinking tea and coffee in the morning. It feels great, actually. I feel much better than bl being bloated. What's going on at the cellular level is a lot. Those longevity genes come on and they turn on a process in particular called autophagy. You might call it autophagy, depending on where you live. And that is the process that grabs the old, old proteins in the cell and digests them. We have a lot of old proteins that sit around and don't do a lot of good. In fact, in the case of Alzheimer's disease, that's the reason we get Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of misfolded old proteins, one called A-beta, for example. And our bodies need to chew those up to stay young and healthy. And a, a, a really good friend of mine and colleague down at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, her name is Maria Anna Cuervo, or Anna Maria Cuervo. You should uh, look her up if you're curious. She's the star of this, and she's discovered a type of autophagy that happens when you go hungry for three or more days. And it's called chaperone-mediated autophagy. And that's the deep cleanse. That grabs all of the really bad proteins and old ones that have crystallized and formed these tight uh, bundles that are very hard to get rid of um, and just chews them up. And mm. she has new work. Uh, I think it's coming out in the next few weeks, actually. She just had a nature paper. Now she's coming out with another big paper that says, if you turn this process on in a mouse, it lives dramatically longer. Um, I, I think it was at least 20% longer and they're healthier. They look great. You look at a mouse that's got this and it's shiny and black coat and the other ones are gray and can barely walk. It's huge. And right now, the only way to stimulate that process is to go hungry or mm -hmm. skip meals, I should say, Rob. Um, but we're develop I'm, I'm working with Anna Maria uh, on a medicine that would give you know patients that kind of feeling so that older people, sick people, people in hospital, you know, obviously wouldn't have to uh, fast for three or more days. That's not necessarily what you want to have if you're recovering from a disease. But here's the point. You can induce hormesis with a pill. And that's what a lot of my companies work on. Uh, we know that three days is good. Is five days optimal? Or do you start to lose muscle mass mm. too much? 
And uh, doctors like Peter Atia, A-T-T-I-A, a good friend of mine, he's self-experimenting, he's got some patients, but we really don't know. We need more clinical trials to know that. Um, I would I would say that what I do is harmless. Three days, probably all good. Five days, I would start to think that any more than that would start to take away muscle mass and you don't want to yeah. do that. All right, well, first the diet, then the science. Uh, so the diet, I'm working with uh, Dean Ornish. You might've mm -hmm. heard of the Ornish diet. Mm -hmm. So Dean is, and I are with another five other scientists running in a clinical trial on Alzheimer's patients. And so far seeing dramatic results. Now his, his diet is lower on calories and focusing on plants um, and just really healthy food. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it seems to be working. Now we'll publish this and we'll do more patients and get more data. But I think that that's the right approach is what he's saying. So if you want to look up the Ornish diet, I'd recommend doing that. O-N-O-R-N-I-S-H. Uh, now the science. Now there are misfolded proteins that accumulate in your brain. They form these little crystals. Uh, A-beta I mentioned is one. alpha synuclein is, is another. And they're very hard to clear. It's thought that actually your body just cannot get rid of these crystals. And you find them inside the cell um, and very much so outside the cell. Now there's been a lot of debate, which is the worst form. Um, I think it's it's clear that some of these are bad for you, no doubt, because there's some therapies based on uh, the clearance of these proteins outside the cell using antibodies. And they're starting to see uh, some pretty promising results. But I'll tell you my view is that it's far easier to prevent them than to try to reverse them. And this is right. why it frustrates me that very few doctors focus on what you can do leading up to actually get it, getting the disease. And that's not just true for Alzheimer's disease, it's true for everything. Right. And I think doctors, because their training has been on, we only treat diseases, we're not preventative you know, medicine doctors, that's for the kooks. We need to change that attitude. <laughs> I mean, how, how many people's doctors spend half of the time with their patient talking about lifestyle, which mm -hmm. I would say, especially in midlife, is far more important then worrying about you know, what kind of flu you might be catching. Well, again, we're, we're on the cutting edge and Wim Hof is right on the bleeding edge. Mm -hmm. uh, the science says that, yeah, turning on heat shock proteins uh, and, and hot temperatures, saunas in general, do seem to have long-term benefits on health. There are some studies that I have referenced in my book, which people can go to to get more detail. But um, mm -hmm. typically it's in Finland where pretty much every house seems to have a, a sauna. If you look at people who do a lot of sauna bathing, they are protected. I think it was 30% less chance of heart, having a heart attack late in life. So those studies are convincing. Actually, I was surprised how convincing the data is. Exactly how they work, we don't know. It might also involve the turning on of these longevity genes, due to hormesis. The cold therapy is actually less known about, but the best explanation I can give right now is that there are longevity genes that respond to cold, not just hot. Mm -hmm. The sirtuin genes that I work on, there's, there's one called number three, sirtuin three, that comes on during cold. And it's really healthy. It turns on the body's brown fat processes and burns energy, it revs up the mitochondria, the battery packs in the cell. And brown fat, which we didn't even know existed 20 years ago in adults, it's usually baby fat. Babies cannot shiver, they have to use brown fat to get warm. Um, but adults can build it up, particularly on the back um, and other regions. It depends on how old you are and who you are. But being cold, you know, I bet you that Wim Hof has a ton of brown fat and that keeps his metabolism going. But also brown fat secretes these little hormones that are increasingly thought to be healthy as well. So it's not just your fat that's in good shape, that your whole body gets the benefits long term. It's not building up more fat. It's converting the fat in your body to become brown or beige. So yeah, you don't build up fat. It's quite the opposite, actually. It'll make you thinner if you have if you have more brown fat. And and actually, what happens is those mitochondria, when you get cold, can uncouple. Now, uncoupling uh, will extend the lifespan of flies and mice. And basically, what uncoupling is is that the body uses uh, some proteins called uncoupling proteins to uh, basically punch holes or let holes through the mitochondria. So, quick biology lesson: mitochondria are like a hydroelectric dam. There's a lot of water inside that gets let out. And as they pass through the hydroelectric turbine, they make energy. And uh, if you let the water through somewhere else, you're not gonna be able to make as much energy. And in doing so, your body get that has the food in it, you know, you, you eat a, a muffin, it's not gonna make as much energy, so it has to work harder. And you 
you know, you expend more energy. What happens to the energy? Well, you know, physic, laws of physics still apply. It comes out as heat. And so your body might go up 0.01 degree Fahrenheit or Celsius. It's very subtle. You don't feel it. And you, but you're expending more energy and that over the long run uh, leads to less weight gain.